just like to start off by thanking Cystic Fibrosis Australia, particularly Anne-Marie Bosch for asking me to speak today. Initially when Anne-Marie rang me, I thought this isn't really something I would consider myself expert in and wondered who I may be able to recommend for the talk. Unfortunately, the person I would have liked to recommend was David Cerizia. I'm not sure if there's anyone from Queensland in the audience, but Anne-Marie and I thought in view of uh, recent events where David sadly passed away, um, that we would like to set up something nationwide on transition and adolescent care dedicated to David in the future. So that's his list of important roles. I first um, knew David as a registrar. He was my registrar up at the Prince Charles many years ago. And he was a person who at all these events was somebody that we always took the time to catch up. This is what I think is David's greatest role. He was very committed to the care of all his patients and to promoting and advancing the care of young people with CF. And I think it's important that we um, continue that on. This slide is just to, um, to put in, just to get rid of the last bit, just to cheer me up for the rest of the talk. And also just to remind everyone that we're doctors, we're physicians, we've got our patients, the kids are coming up to adult care, I'm an adult physician. We're parents and we'll always be parents and that's important for the adult world to remember. Also, we'll always be children of our parents and parents will remain um, involved in care until you're late into your adult years. But it doesn't mean that we have to help the children to become independent young people as they transition into the adult world. So how does this fit with CF? When I first started working with CF, probably 10 years before this graph begins, there wasn't actually that many adults who had CF and potentially not a, a great career choice. But pleasingly with all the advances in um, care, we're now looking at at least 50% of the CF population in Australia um, are adults rather than children. And at the start of the CF registry back in 1998, only half that proportion were adults. So transition is becoming more and more important as almost all of our CF um, population these days will experience it. Just to narrow that down, in some states, Victoria, um, Tassie and I think one other, there's actually more adults with CF than children now. And that's really exciting. So transition specifically. Um, Oxford Dictionary defines that as the passage or change from one place or state or set of circumstance to another. Healthcare transition specifically defined as a purposeful planned movement of adolescents and young adults with chronic physical and medical conditions from child centre to adult orientated healthcare systems. And there is a big difference. Child centred sy systems seem um, are very family centred and very child centred. Adult centres don't involve the family as much. They need to along the way, but there is a period of time where we need to help the young adults um, manage things by themselves. So the goals of transition. For young people, healthcare transition includes processes by which patients increase their self-knowledge and their self-management skills. They need to prepare for this transfer to a different um, focus in their health services. Through this process, adolescents are prepared to assume responsibility for their care. So we need to stop thinking as transition as transfer. Transfer is not transition. Transfer is a movement from one service to a new one at a single point in time. Transition is a process not just about that move, but about young people becoming knowledgeable, becoming empowered and taking responsibility for their care. And that's not necessarily going to occur when they turn 18. It may occur for some earlier and it may occur for some well beyond 18 years. And they all need support and they all need individualised support. The goals of an organised, coordinated transition to adult healthcare for young people with chronic conditions are to optimise their health, but most importantly, to facil facilitate each young person attaining his or her maximal potential. When I first worked in CF, really adult CF care was about CF. Not anymore these days. Most people with CF, that's only a small part of their lives and that's how it should be. And it's our role not just to focus on their medical condition, but to focus on them as a person and how the medical condition can fit into their life now and not vice versa. 
So therefore, what do we need to discuss with them through the transition period? When I first meet a patient, I don't ask them about their disease at all. I ask them about who they are. What are they doing? What do they want to do? When I'm over at the Women's and Children's Hospital, I'd rarely talk to the adolescents there about their health care. Their paediatricians are still doing that. I'd ask them, how's life? What are they doing at school? What are their plans for the future? So there's short-term goals and there's long-term goals. Things that need to be thought of through transition, the short-term goal might be, say, to get into medicine or nursing. In that discussion, they do need to be aware of infection control, for instance. No point finding they can't go on and work where they really want to work when they're well down the path. Early in the path of those sorts of um, decisions, you can help them to frame it so that their CF isn't going to impact on um, their life choices too much. It's important to understand from them how CF affects their life now. Not me sit there telling them all about CF, but them tell me how do, what does it mean to them, what's it doing to them. The information I might share with them is how it might affect their life in the future and the things they can do now to improve things down the track. I'm going to flag a few specific health topics within this framework and that's important because often they're not things that are spoken about, often they're things that we expect the patients will bring up, but in fact, if you offer them the information, most of them want it. But they're not necessarily going to ask you about it, sometimes because they're too embarrassed. The topic itself, their lack of knowledge, they don't want to show that. They want to show you that they know everything there is to know about CF on the whole, or they want to show you that they don't really care. But if you raise the topics with them and encourage them to ask the questions, then they usually will. It might not be today, it might not be next, next appointment, but over the years they know that those topics are ones that they can bring up with you. And that's an important part of transition. So some of the things I think about, and with the audience here, I'm very keen to sort of hear other people's thoughts along the way. When you read the literature on transition, there's quite a bit of literature. There's some evidence in there, but most of it's opinion and most of it is just descriptive terms about what people do. I think what you do and how you do it is open to discussion and that's something that we'd like to develop down the track and really look at in Australia trying to have that driven by the CF community, um, what their thoughts are and where they would like to um, see this area lead. So importantly, careers and hobbies. Let's have a chat about that. If our patients want to work in childcare or in early schooling, early teaching, that's important because their times and occupations that are, are quite risky for adults, little kids have lots of infections. So when our young adults and older adults choose to have their families, there's going to be a period in their life where they're hit with all the bugs from their young kids. But if you continually work in that area, that's a risk. So these are things that if you just ask them, how are you today, what's your sputum doing, how's your exercise, are you having your nebs, you're not going to explore the bigger issues until they get into trouble. That's what's meant by transition, not transfer. So things, careers, hobbies, families and friends, who can they depend on, who's there for them, that'll change over time. When people become adults, they have the right to make choices. Some adult programs will actually say that the children or the young adults aren't allowed to bring their parents into a consultation. That sort of goes against the grain because they're adults and they've got the right to have in the consultation whoever they want. So they're sort of things like that that need to be thought through. Not everyone's ready straight away to come by themselves, particularly to a new place. Many people are. Mostly their parents will come for the first few appointments and then they just gradually drop along the way. Some parents are quite stressed that they might not be able to come. A lot of parents are stressed that they're coming and they shouldn't be and they know they need to let go. So to them I say, don't worry about it. Along the way, the parents drop off at some point. It doesn't have to be at birthday number 18. And it might be for a lot of people, it's actually first few years, you just gradually see less of the parents. It doesn't need to be um, a major thing at a point in time. It will gradually happen if you're managing transition well with the, the kids and their families. Drugs, alcohol, smoking. So again, ideally you do get, you, you want to have the opportunity with people as young as possible to talk to them without parents so you can bring up things that they won't necessarily share with you. Although these days a lot of young people do share these um, things with their parents and they are topics of conversations they have with their families. Sexual health issues, again they're probably more comfortable without their parents in the room. In those conversations also things like genetics, 
it's surprising how many young adults or young people or older adults actually don't understand the genetics of CF. It's knowledge we kind of assume. It's probably been told to them before. But when you're a young person, you're not really interested in all of that. So again, that can be quickly explained and something they're usually quite interested in. Also something to flag early on, so at the point they do want to have their families, they might not remember the detail of it, but they'll have a vague memory that it's something they need to ask about again, and you can talk to them and hopefully get some planning in advance. Fertility issues. A lot of women with CF um, think that they will have fertility issues, so that's always something I bring up with the young women as, as well as the young men, so that they're clear on that. They kind of understand, they've, they've got a little bit of an idea, but most of them don't really know and they do appreciate um, hearing about it and knowing, having the knowledge. Survival and transplantation, that's a tricky one. So it's very difficult if you're 18, you're an adolescent, life's very demanding when you're that age. Many things to do, you can't keep up with your friends if you're actually at that point of being very sick and suddenly you've got to leave your trusted healthcare team of a lifetime, perhaps just for a short time, um, to undergo what will be probably the most difficult time of your life and your family's life. So there's times and situations where we've just got to modify what we do for those young people. But also in the broader sense, even if people have normal lung function, I would talk to them about those issues again. They kind of think maybe CF's a life-limiting disease. In the past, people thought that. These days, a lot of young adults come through actually not really having much of an idea about that. Maybe it's been spoken of at some time, but they just come through thinking they're like everybody else. They're living their lives like everyone else. And unfortunately, there's some modifications they need to make. So important to flag that. Also transplants, something a lot of people, as their lung function tends to fall, they worry about. They don't want to ask about it. They're scared to ask about it. Um, but they want to know about it. And they're actually quite grateful to have the facts, even if sometimes they're not ones they want to hear. Mostly they are, because these days most people are way off um, that point in time. Whereas, as I say, when I first started working in CF, um, well, initially a transplant wasn't there for most people. Um, and survival was not very long into adulthood. So again, that's something that's been really great to see. Current medications, this is very important. Transition, has this been talked about over the years? What do they take, what don't they take? When I worked at Monash, we are a joint paediatric and adult unit. We had all our meetings together, it was a beautiful setup. Um, and I used to say to the paediatricians, how do you make them do all that? And they say, well, we tell the parents they have to do it and they do it. So the adult world's not like that, so we need to begin to explore with them what, are they, what do they take, and when you ask them, a lot of them will look at you like you're mad, well you know what I take, now I've got your drug list but I want to just hear the routine of what you actually take. Things like your nebulizer. How, how often do you take that? My question is, you know, do you take that every day? Yes, of course I take it every day. Well out of seven days, how many days do you take it? Oh, three or four. So that's important to know. It's important that you're helping the young people to know they can talk to you. You want to actually know what they're doing. You want to know about them. You don't want to lecture them. You want to work with them about how you're going to help them to do it all better. Mostly with nebulizers, oh, three or four, and they're taking their antibiotics, their hypertonic saline, their pulmazine. The three or four days are the same for every nebulizer. So it's three or four days with everything and three or four days with nothing. So particularly for antibiotic, that's bad, that's dangerous. So the first thing I do is, OK, which one do you think helps you the most? Which one do you usually remember? Let's cut out all the others and just go with the one that you can take. So you need to work with young people and you need to make what they're doing doable for them and fitting into their life. And again, that's about transition. We're not just talking they've come from the Women's and Children's to Royal Adelaide or the Royal Children's to the Alfred. We're talking about how they're developing as, as adults, how they're taking responsibility for their care. And that doesn't happen at that first visit to the adult centre or their last visit to the children's. It happens over a period of time. It happens under the care of both paediatricians where transition tends to be focused. But I think these days, more and more so, 
um, in the adult world. And we don't tend to have a transition focus in adult. We don't tend to think of transition as something that we formally need to set up on the adult side of 18. Personally, I think it is. Um, but you, again, I may be um, biased because I'm an adult physician. I see a lot of it. And I think that's where we need the buy-in of the CF community. What do people want? What works? What hasn't worked? Um, getting down to things like an action plan. What do you do if you're unwell? I just get sicker and eventually I'll come into clinic and start everything. So again, helping them to be more um, self-managing, making sure they've got antibiotics at home if that's the right action plan for them. Helping them if, well, I don't think you need to take your nebulizers every day, but when you get a cold, that's when you start them up. So helping them all to have a plan where they feel they can intervene and they don't have to ask someone else what to do all the time. And that's part of transition and empowerment. And empowerment means, should mean that. It means that you expect the patients to feel strong enough and confident enough to take on their own care and not need to be micromanaged by their parents or by their healthcare practitioners. But you want them to call you whenever they need to. So relationship building is also a very important part of transition. Um, specific medical complications. Again, not something that's thought of, but there are things that commonly happen to people with CF um, that's going to potentially happen to them at some point in their adult lifetime. And it's not all the basic stuff. I always like to bring up the concept of hemoptysis, coughing up a lot of blood. If that's never happened to you before and you're not expecting it to happen, it suddenly happens, it can be terrifying. But if it's something that, oh no, you know, Jude said this could happen, I'll just call the CF centre, or no, I'm not quite sure, I'll call the ambulance and go in, but they stay calm and everything's okay. So again, transition is about giving them all the relevant information that they can work with over their lifetime. And block gut constipation, we call it distal intestinal obstruction, but for adults with CF, um, that's often one of the major things we see them coming into hospital with and one of the major things that can often be mismanaged if the CF team's not involved early. So again, as they're coming to be adults, filling their heads with ideas, they don't have to remember the detail, but as they're going through their adult life, they can just, that'll ring a bell, I know I need to call someone, I know I do need to do this, I can't remember what was said, but I don't need to panic, I just need to ring for help. Lung function. You think they know their lung function, their FEV1. I start all my consults or sometime during the consult, how is your lung function? And if they don't know, then that's a problem. It means they don't understand why they're doing a test. It means they don't understand what it means and therefore likely that they're not getting the importance of intervening. So most, again, most people are very interested to get the detail of that. And if you just accept, no, I don't know, I'd leave it at that, move on, which does happen then they never learn. So you're always looking for opportunities to give more information, more knowledge, and more empowerment to the patient. And sometimes that goes against the grain of adult medicine too. You know, you like to know people will come in, do what you say, and fall over every word that you, you, and every bit of information you give them. I get a lot of my information from patients, particularly all these new drugs that were coming through. Um, a lot of that information I get from patients. So you want your patients to keep you informed about stuff that, um, you know, they're right on the ball with lots of things and can lead you on the right path too. Now, this was um, an article that's very recent. It was published while we were overseas recently. Initially I read it, I thought it was good. It was a program called Ready, Steady, Go in the UK. But the more I read it, it's often sort of a bit negative. It has all these questions, talks about the barriers, and then the first sentence of every answer is criticising, critical of the healthcare system. Most people think this, they don't understand. And that's, I don't think, an article that people will feel kindly about and won't necessarily bring about the change they want. But, so I'm not going to put up the answers mostly, just the questions. I think in transition there's lots of questions and lots of stuff we need to find out about. So what are the barriers to high quality um, transition? When they set up this program, they initially um, surveyed their country, so it's the UK, slightly different healthcare model to here, and looked at the common misconceptions preventing timely implementation of effective transition. Some of these are useful ideas. I like this one, even though I've said it before. Transition and transfer, what's the difference? 
Transition is sometimes treated as an event rather than a gradual process of empowerment. If you think of it that way, transition and moving on to adult cares are a very positive thing for young people and that's how it should be. Do you need to have a transition clinic in place in order to start transition? You know, do we have to set up some big model of transition? Do we have to have people separate to the CF unit coming in? Does the CF unit have to have specified transition sections coming in? Well, actually, no, it's about empowering the young people, and they use YP right through this article, and equipping them, equipping them with the knowledge and skills to manage their health care. And that can occur in any clinic. It can occur by any healthcare professional who has a commitment to that. Often it might be... Um, a patient particularly um, has a good relationship with the physio. The physios traditionally spend a lot of time with people, so they might be the ones that are really helping them along the path to transition empowerment. It might be the doctor, often it's the clinic nurse. Can transition begin? I, I like this one because actually just to remind the CF community that not all rarer conditions and not all debilitating chronic conditions actually have a good path to the adult world. Um, can it begin without an identified adult team to which the young person's care can be transferred? Well, it can because transition is not an event, it's not a transfer, it's a process of empowering them. Unfortunately for a lot of particularly, say, um, young people with neurological conditions who are debilitated, there isn't places for them to go to into the adult world, there isn't clinics. So we're actually way ahead of the game in CF because we're well resourced, because we've got good consumer advocacy that have increased our resources over the years, but there's a lot of other young people moving into the adult world who really don't have such a smooth path. And I'm not saying that the path in CF is smooth either. But if we do it better, then that'll have flow on benefits to other young people. Does it need to be subspecialty specific? So the answer to that is no. That means, you know, is CF transition different to diabetes transition? Is it different to cancer transition? Well, there's things that are different, but in general, transition issues are generic regardless of the underlying disease. When should it be started? Hotly debated. Um, so studies show that starting transition around 11 or 12 does lead to better knowledge and skills and better outcomes at transition. I think most people quote that, most people know that. Um, but, you know, is it really done? Are we really focusing on the 11 and 12 year olds to start moving into it? Well, maybe we're not. Maybe it's also not appropriate. I mean, because I go to the women's and children's, I only see the 16 to 18 year olds. But even the 16 year olds aren't, a lot of them aren't really, you know, up for changes and taking responsibility. So, again, I think that's information it would be good to get from the CF world in Australia. You know, where, where does everyone think it should be? Um, and should transition really be focused in the 18 to 20 year old group when they really are taking an interest, they are taking responsibility? Maybe we do more then, less before, maybe we do more before, so they're better ready for that. Um, I think we don't know that, we need to work it out. And is it right to transfer people? So in general, Australia, 18, finish of year 12, a lot happening at the end of year 12. Do we really want them swapping um, from their known and safe healthcare team to another one at that time? Maybe that's a good thing because they're very ready for change. Their life's changing in all sorts of ways. So the challenges that I see, um, number one, mental and psychosocial health. We see a lot of disadvantaged young people and disadvantaged young people who are socially disadvantaged, who get involved with drug, the drug world in particular, they're the ones we're not getting to transplant and they're the ones that are dying at the young age. And that's really sad. I'd say everybody since I've been in Adelaide who hasn't made it to transplant, it's because of drugs. So it's an increasing problem in our society and one that we shouldn't ignore. We need better support from drug and alcohol services and better access to psychological and psychiatric care. I don't really know of any CF service that feels they can easily get psychiatric involvement. It's quite difficult. It's doable, but it's a bit of work. A lot of people really need that. Um, their sexuality, survival transplant, you know, how do you talk about that? And I think it's best just to be honest. And big question, I think, is where will the transition programs be most useful? They're really focused in the paediatric setting. I think we need to extend that more into the adult setting. So my answer is obviously both. Finally, the start of the talk from Anne-Marie made the, uh, the starting there. Have your say. 
So it can be at a very small level. Often people make things so big that it's hard to start anywhere. So you just need to start small to make a difference. And that could be simply by speaking up at your CF centre. Constructive feedback and ideas. Don't just speak up when there's a problem and there's a complaint. Often in that setting you're not really listened to, but if you go there with a pos positive message of something you think that could be done better and suggestions, people don't tend to do that and that's how you make change. I know when we had our um, patient feedback from the peer review um, and there were things that were like personal attacks on various um, members of staff, etc., immediately that feedback is discounted. So I'd just like to put in a little plug at the end of the talk for something that CFA will be doing in the upcoming months, and that is they'll be starting some consumer advocacy training that'll be based in each state, if anyone's interested. Um, just speak to your local um, CF um, CEO, or just ring your CF organisation, where's it at, flag your interest. And that's about giving people, giving patients, parents, friends, consumers the skills to know how to feed things back and make a difference. And that will make a big difference. Does your CF centre have a patient advisory group? I, tr I tried to set one up at Monash, not sure how that's going, if it's come up yet. Um, but that's a really good thing to do. There's a lot of those overseas. And we would like to develop a national survey on transition. That would be what I would like to do, to target as the first step, that included young adults with CF, adolescents with CF, the parents of both. The parents of adults probably have a lot of good insights they can give us, and healthcare professionals. And I'd like to do it with the first four groups, guiding it as much as the last group. The results may surprise you or not. So what was interesting here is if you look at the two process things, um, where it says, are you concerned about moving or are your parents concerned? In this survey, which is a while ago in the UK, maybe it's an excellent centre and an excellent transition process, but mostly they weren't. So maybe we worry more than they do in some, some cases. Um, and finally, maybe leading in with the consumer um, advocacy uh, group and work to set up a national working group through, this, through Cystic Fibrosis Australia, again consisting of consumers and professionals, and that's what we'd like to do um, in memory of David.